um, New York police, no record. They even said they called the checked out the FBI. Mm. Then they did what I've been trying to get them to do all along. They really searched me, pulled out my key, and pulled out better funds than itinerary. And when they saw better funds than I name name, I don't know if you know, but better funds was a pretty big name in the city. Yeah, yeah. Uh, everybody changed, uh, and I was stupid. Because had I really, been, I'm 24 and dumb, and I really thought I could have called the ACLU or the NAACP, and though it was 1961, and you know what would happen, I might have had a case, right? Uh, later on, uh, we got a letter of apology from a, um, a LA alderman, but when I talk about George Floyd, what, uh, what happened when they did beat me up and put me down on the pavement, the guy tried to choke hold me. Mm. Right, uh, he didn't put his knee under me, trying to choke hold me, and he didn't know how to do it because basically uh, that choke hold, uh, as you know, can kill you. And once you do it right, you're going to be out in 20 seconds. Uh, so um, I don't know. I'm I'm diverting, but since we talk, just talking, right. um, uh, that's the thing that's going on. Right. Whenever I see that, I think about about that. That yeah. was my first false arrest, and I had another one in New York. But if you okay, don't let me talk, talk, talk. Uh, ask me something, Tab. You know about that. You know about that chokehold because, correct me if I'm wrong. You're a uh, uh, first degree, second degree black belt, if I'm not mistaken. I'm first degree, yes. <laughs> How long have I'm you been first degree, but, black? but I'm 83 now, so uh, don't let that be out. Uh, <laughs> I, I, <laughs> I actually, uh, I became a, um, you know, practitioner of a. Uh, Taekwondo um, when I was in my late 20s, mm -hmm. right? And I studied under a guy whose who name was Duck Soon Sun, who was the first um, um, teacher for when West Point decided they wanted to uh, be trained in uh, karate, they got this guy. And his, um, his um, arena was on like a Mercer Street in the village, in the West Village. Yeah, I mean, it actually, um, you know, if you're five foot six and you don't weigh that much, uh, you may as well keep quiet about whatever your skills are, because, <laughs> okay. Uh, um, and I used to try to talk my way out of stuff. And I really wanted to karate more because I thought it would help me psychologically and spiritually, which it did. I didn't really go in to try to learn how to, how to really fight anybody, but it did, in fact, um, save my life, I think, of... Uh, in 1994, when some people tried to rob me, and uh, you know, um, the guy when he grabbed me, uh, he had the gun to my uh, to my rib, which means if he had shot, then I'd be dead. Uh, but what I did, um, you know, got me out of the thing, and I turned around, and it was a, about a six foot young black uh, young man, about six feet, six feet. And he had a gun put in my face. And believe me, I'm Sam, look, man, if you're coming from me with a gun and say, give me your money, I'm giving you my money. I'm taking off my clothes. I'm giving you that. Mm -hmm. My car was outside. I'm going to give the guy my car. My wife was at home. <laughs> okay? Mm -hmm. What I'm saying is I don't try to fight nobody. Not only because I'm, you know, I, then because I was short and way much. But because I don't really believe them, that's the last resort. And I don't believe in trying to fight nobody with bullets, right? But the only reason why I even did what I did was because he came from behind. It was right. him and a girl. And I didn't know what was going on. So I just did something. When I got around, and there was a gang on one side of the street. And I think he was a little embarrassed by that, that a 55-year-old man um, could hook it up like that. But this boy had to be about 19 or 20 years old. Uh, anyway, I um, he shot me, and um, you know, I, right away I went out, um, and um, a friend of mine uh, heard me from down the street, called his name, and he came down, and the people on the street helped out, got me into the car. Mind you, I'm, I'm already out, and he's when I wake up, he's driving me through the red light. I'm flying to Quencher. Have you ever been to? L.A., you know, front of Crenshaw at 12 o'clock, ain't that much people there. Mm -hmm. Well, this time was nobody there. That's one miracle. Mm -hmm. So we get to the um, to the hospital down in Freeman, 
And, um, you know, uh, I'm going out. And the guy who drove me, the nurse says to him, does he need a wheelchair? And he cussed me out because it should have been obvious I needed it. Anyway, after going up in the elevator, um, the doctor who's leaving to go home for the night, the nurse says to him, are you an arteriologist? I don't know what the fuck that is. Anyway, yeah, that's a specialist on hooking up your arteries, right? Mm -hmm. And apparently I needed that. He was going home. She said, come on back up, right? Also, when I got up, upstairs in the Dana Freeman Hospital, there was a trauma group there, right? Which is what I needed. I don't know if you know, but if you're going to a coma, you basically need a trauma group to hook you up. Now, the miracle about that is um, the, the president had defunded trauma groups for that year. So they were only allowed to meet twice a year. Well, hey, also, this was their first night meeting for that year. That's my second miracle, my third miracle, rather. Right? And sure enough, um, when I had gone out, I said, you know, Lord, if this is it, you know, I'm ready to face you. Hey, uh, I ain't afraid to die, all that bullshit. Sure enough, when I woke up out of the coma in three days and I saw I was alive, I said, Lord, hold on. I was just, you know, mm -hmm. I was just talking tongues out of my head. Mm -hmm. uh, because definitely that was a miracle, too. Uh, and, um, you know, anyway, I don't know, I'm never written again. But that was one time when whatever little skills I had helped me out a lot. Now, um, at this time, if I'm not mistaken, you were um, at that point fired from the Martin Show. They wrote you out. You got all there. the news. You got all of the hot news. Uh, can you talk uh, about that? Them uh, being in the room, I think, when they fired you? No, let me say this. Let me say this. Uh, Martin is a genius. Yeah. Okay? He's a comedy genius. And I don't really enjoy saying stuff, but if he hadn't gone out on the radio and the TV and said, the absolute, an absolute lie, I wouldn't be talking right now, okay? Um, but uh, he's a genius who I found out is bipolar, and he, uh, uh, you know, he needs to take his medicine, duck take it. And I'm assuming that this particular time, he hadn't taken his medicine, because hmm. when I was about three days in Daniel Freeman Hospital, undergoing about uh, 10 major operations, about the third day, I got a script saying, uh, Stan, that's my character. You saw Martin, right? That's Stan, all right. Yeah, Stan sells the radio station and moves to China. Now, Sam, does that mean I'm no longer in the fucking show? Yeah, I don't think they do episodes in China. Stan was no, in the UP. Right, <laughs> right. And uh, this is not ever talking to me or calling with they no, nothing, right? So, I felt, you know, um, that I at least deserve a phone call. But here's why I didn't feel depressed. Because I'd already been brought back from what I thought was the dead. So I'm feeling really, really, really great, blessed, lucky, all of that, you know. And I was in, despite all the pain, I was in a euphoric kind of a feeling because I felt like I had been given a little bit more time, right? After having gone through which should have killed anybody, a whole lot, anybody else, here I was alive. So this what would have been a really depressing thing uh, didn't bother me at all in terms of my esteem. My esteem was still high and it remained high. Uh, but yes, uh, my man did do that. And like I say, I respect his, uh, he's a gifted, gifted uh, comedian. Uh, but, you know, I, I, and later on I found out that he was, you know, had a, he needed to be taken as medicine. Uh, so I'm gonna give him, you know, the benefit of the doubt that that was the period when he had to take it. Did, did you feel betrayed though by the fact that they would fire you when you were in such a precarious situation? Pretty much. I, I felt a little bit of that, yeah. Because I mean, whatever was going down, if you had produced the show, you had the right to do whatever you want. Yeah. But you know, three years I had never had any argument with him ever, so I had no understanding as to why. And I thought I'd been contributing to the show because I, you know, I was getting my fan mails too, right? So, um, and you know, for me, the cast was great. Tisha was great. The mm -hmm. Sheena was great. Um, 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 my man who died, Tommy, yeah, great. Carl Payne, great. Uh, you know, uh, and 
Martin, you know, is a gifted comedian. So uh, as someone who has been given that mantle, although I don't think I am that, I'm an actor who was in a show a long time ago, and they started calling me funny. Like I tell you, my ex-wife would tell me all the time, nigga, you ain't funny, you know? <laughs> so, <laughs> that's why That's why she's my ex. <laughs> so Martin did, I mean, they, you did get brought back on the cameo. I think it was that Rental Spoons episode where y'all brought that restaurant together. Did you and Martin have a conversation where he apologized? How, how did that come about? No, no, we never had a conversation. No, we never had a conversation. And, uh, you know, um, like I said, you got a right to do what you want with your show. But yeah. I think some kind of way you do it is, uh, you know, and as someone who has made a lot of mistakes in my life, uh, I'm not, you know, I, I'm, forgiveness is way beyond that. I, I don't feel anything about it. He's cool with me. Like, I think he's a comedy genius. Uh, I just think he, he should have taken his medicine that time. That's all. Wow. Well,